Deputy Prime Minister Heng Sui Kiet, Patron of ISAS, Emeritus Senior Minister Go Chok Tong, Founding Patron of ISAS, Professor Tan Tai Yong, Chair, Associate Professor Iqbal Singh Saviour, Director of ISAS, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, and Ladies and Gentlemen, it's, it's really a pleasure to join you this evening to celebrate the 20th anniversary of ISAS. It's uh, wonderful to see so many of you here, some of whom I've met um, twice before the same week, but it shows that we are quite a, <laughs> quite a well-networked community. Business, academics, some of you donors, but it's a community with a, a common interest, uh, not only in understanding South Asia well, but in strengthening the relationship between Singapore, Southeast Asia, and South Asia, and it's going well. If you think back to when ESM Go first mooted the idea of ISS and then launched it 20 years ago, uh, his objective, as Taiyong was just reminding us, was in many ways strategic. It was a strategic imperative to deepen our understanding of South Asia. And ISIS has, I feel, done that very well. It's only 20 years, but I think you've done very well in firstly bridging the deficit in knowledge um, and expertise that existed at that time on India and the rest of South Asia. But more than bridging the deficit, I think you've been advancing research. You've been advancing knowledge uh, on South Asia. Plus, you've been acting as a bridge between people academics, experts, business leaders, and, and many others through your many conferences, symposiums, roundtables, workshops, and so on. You've been bringing people together from South Asia here, including some others from Southeast Asia. It's created a stronger network of both research as well as business leaders within close interest, with a close interest in relations with South Asia. So congratulations to ISAS. I join Taiyong in um, expressing deep admiration for the role that Mr. Gopinath Pele played. He, he, uh, I had many interactions with him, but he, he took it not just as a appointment, but as a passion. He really put effort into ISAS, and we really owe him, uh, owe him a lot for that. And uh, I think Taiyong, you've also done an exceptionally good job. Uh, I hope your next 20 years in ISAS will be as, far, as effective as the first 20 years. Um, I should mention that two ISAS initiatives um, are particularly significant in the broader context of our relations with India. One is the India-Singapore Strategic Dialogue, or ISSD, what in diplomatic parlance they call a Track 1.5 uh, initiative. Uh, it's working well, range of stakeholders, some officials participating, but principally uh, persons who are business leaders, journalists, commentators, civil society um, uh, leaders, and so on. And it's been very useful in shaping ideas and giving governments ideas about the way forward in relations between India and Singapore. So that's one good initiative. A second one is the South Asian Diaspora Convention, um, also long-standing now, uh, which brings together uh, the diaspora who are in various positions of influence, policy makers, business leaders, academics, and so on. That's working very well, and by focusing on specific themes, women's empowerment, infrastructure, fintech, and, and so on. It's been a product, productive uh, convention. Uh, let me say a few words very briefly about the bilateral relationship between Singapore and India. I'm optimistic about the relationship. We should be able to build greater depth and breadth in our relations with India in the coming years. India has just elected a new government following its general elections last month. We have congratulated Prime Minister Modi for winning a third term 
which is a remarkable feat in a massive, robust, and in many ways decentralized democracy. It's a remarkable feat. And it speaks to how millions of people have seen their lives uplifted, especially by gaining the basic amenities and services that have eluded them for decades. It also reflects an awareness of India's rise. It's becoming the fastest growing and most promising large economy in the world. We can expect broad continuity in India's domestic and foreign policies. Certainly, we should expect our bilateral relations, which are deep and enduring, to remain on an upward trajectory. We've seen extensive investments by Singapore investors in India in recent years and growing interactions between our business communities, including some major joint ventures. And the mood remains bullish on the part of the business communities. Our two governments are also working closely on issues such as food security, energy and the green economy, digitalization and skills development, including the training and recruitment of nurses from the Northeast in India. Beyond our bilateral relations, let me offer a few broader thoughts about how India and Southeast Asia respond to the new global economic and geopolitical realities. First, I believe that both India and Southeast Asia are poised to create a new era of opportunity, equity, and sustainability. I say that because both regions are well positioned to do so. We are well positioned first because we are not caught up at the sharp edges of the largest geopolitical conflicts of the times. You would not find us at either pole of any of the major tensions that we see in the world today neither India nor Southeast Asia. You will not find us at either pole the major tensions that we see in the world today. Secondly, we both have societies that are looking upward. That's a little rare in the world today, where the majority of people, ordinary people, hope to see a major uplift in their lives and see a chance of achieving it. That too distinguishes the two regions. So there's the geopolitical positioning that's an advantage. There's the social characteristic of both regions that's an advantage. And if you put it together, it gives us this opportunity of creating an era of opportunity, equity, and sustainability. In the decade ahead, we have to respond to new global realities but also seek to shape it, to shape it in ways that secure each of our national interests and the global good at the same time. I say shape it, not just respond to it, because India and Southeast Asia do have agency, particularly if we both respond with the same broad orientations. Remember, together we make up a quarter of the world's population, about 15% of the world's GDP, and more importantly, we are the fastest growing regions in the world. So we do have agency. And we can and must use this agency wisely. I believe we can do so by adopting a few strategic orientations. First, by thinking long term rather than responding to the geopolitics of the day, or, as has happened in many countries, by responding to the domestic mood of the moment. Second, by investing more actively to grow human potential. Third, by resisting further global economic fragmentation, which will ultimately hurt every nation. And finally, by collaborating to slow climate change and halt the deterioration in the planet's ecology, 
which is in all our interests. I believe these strategic orientations, pursued with vigor, give us the best chance of securing our national interests and the global good at the same time. Let me go on to a second issue, which concerns the implications of the shift to interventionist industrial policies, especially in the major economies. Industrial intervention is seeing a resurgence around the world on a scale not seen since the 1960s and 1970s. It started in the 1950s in some places, and it was in full swing in the 1960s and 1970s, and as we know, it largely failed. The shift now is taking place largely by way of drift and tit-for-tat actions. It is not a confident resetting of policy, informed by powerful new evidence or by a cogent reappraisal of the economics of prosperity. But the new industrial interventionism is nevertheless creating a new global reality, an unstable competition of industrial subsidies and a shifting but unpredictable geometry of trade and investments. In other words, it is both a reaction to heightened geopolitical contestation and a further source of weakening of the global economic order. Let me make three observations on how we respond to this global trend in both our regions, both South Asia and Southeast Asia. First, industrial policies should be focused on upgrading our capabilities rather than crowding out other countries. We have to remind ourselves that innovation remains the fundamental driver of long-term growth in every country. We either spur innovation through competition of capabilities or we stifle innovation by cutting out the competition. The IMF has found that of the 2,500 or so industrial interventions in just the last year, over two-thirds were intended to discriminate against foreign interests. We cannot go far wrong with industrial policies that focus on developing our capabilities through both economy-wide policies, such as investment in basic R&D and education, or cluster-based strategies to, to develop deep applied strengths and synergies between firms. That's the good industrial policy. And we will also find that economic performance is aided by adapting and ad adopting and adapting the best technologies and innovations, regardless of where they come from. In reality, doing so often goes hand in hand with developing national capabilities. That openness towards the best technologies and innovations typically goes hand in hand with developing national capabilities. It's not an either or. A second observation, for industrial policy to succeed, we need social policy on an industrial scale. To develop every human talent, to deepen and upgrade skills continually, and to advance social mobility. And that requires new forms of collaboration between the public sector, enterprises, unions, and community organizations, and of course, educational and training institutions, which makes it a complex endeavor, a large scale and complex endeavor, but an important one, and it is too often neglected in the rush to implement industrial policy in its narrow definition. There's also a political point here. There's an important nexus to be achieved here. Investments in social inclusivity are critical to keeping intact the political consensus needed for open economic and industrial policies. And it's that economic, social, and political nexus that helps us achieve our long-term goals of good jobs and shared prosperity. 
they go together or they each fall apart. Thirdly, there is potential for India, Southeast Asia and other responsible middle powers to work collectively to build resilience in multilateralism, regionalism and coalitions to tackle cross-cutting global issues. I'm glad, for example, to see India's leadership in establishing the International Solar Alliance, which Singapore has joined and actively supported. Even though coalitions like these are not universal in membership, they help to create momentum in the direction of multilateralism, an arrangement that, while never perfect and always frustrating in its processes, has served nations rich and poor well for the last few decades. A concluding concern. The new industrial interventionism has found favour amongst politicians, not surprisingly, but also amongst many economists. We should guard against the reverse of John Maynard Keynes' dictum on politicians. His dictum was that politicians who, despite them believing themselves to be exempt of intellectual influences, were usually the slaves of some defunct economists. The equal danger we run today is of economists and commentators, not least those in the advanced economies, despite protestations of independence, being in the service of the political temper of the times. Beware that reversal of Keynes's dictum. I'm sure ISAS will continue to bring outstanding minds from India, Southeast Asia, and others in East Asia to help advance honest thinking on our long-term interests and to help build robust partnerships in a troubled world. I wish you all success in this important endeavor. Thank you.